Okay, so we left off last time um, with the sorting hat. We saw Harry get sorted, and I'm going to I'm going to skip a bit, a bunch. Skipping the potions master, you know, it's Snape being <coughs> Snape to um, <coughs> Harry, and I want to go to the chapter of the midnight duel because we see a second instance here. The first time we saw this was on the train. We see a second instance here of Harry stand up for, not literally, metaphorically, stand up for somebody who is defenseless. Now on the train, Ron isn't defenseless. He can stand up for himself. But in this chapter, we see that they have their first flying lessons. And Malfoy brings his remember all that he got from his grandmother, uh, sorry, Neville, and he, he jumps on his broom, flies up before they're supposed to, and then falls and drops it, okay? So Madam Hooch takes Neville off to the hospital wing, the infirmary, and Malfoy picks it up. Page 148 says, look, it's this stupid thing Longbottom's grand sent him. Harry, give that ear, Malfoy. Malfoy says, I think I'll leave it somewhere Leave it somewhere for Longbottom to find. How about up a tree? Harry yells, give it here. Malfoy gets on a broom and gets up in the air. Hermione yells at Harry, no, why? She's thinking house points. And Harry gets on his broom, 148 at the bottom, blood pounding in his ears. He mounts the broom, and what does he discover? In a fierce rush of joy, he realized he'd found something he could do without being taught. This was easy. This was wonderful. This is an example of what the Sorting Hat was talking about when it said, talent? Oh my, yes. Raw, innate ability. Okay? So, he turns his broomstick sharply to Malfoy and says, give it here or I'll knock you off that broom. And notice we're told, Malfoy looks worried. No crab and goyle up here to save your neck, Malfoy. In other words, it's just you and me now. So Malfoy says, fine, catch it if you can, and throws the remember all. Does Harry chase the remember all? No. When Malfoy throws it, Harry kind of watches it. And let's, you can imagine, though, obviously Harry would not be able to do this because he's not really that bright. It's like he does the trigonometry for where this thing is going to fall. And as he watches it move, he's flying to where it's going to come down. And he catches it just before it hits the ground. Now what do, what does Harry and what do Hermione and others think when McGonagall, come, McGonagall comes out screeching his name? He's toast, man. This is McGonagall after all, okay? But he's not toast, right? What happens to him instead? He gets made seeker of the Gryffindor Quidditch team. The youngest seeker, we're told, or we will be told, in a hundred years. Okay? We also are told by McGonagall what about his father? He was, a he was also a seeker. Okay? So here he's just received some information about his father he never knew before. So he gets made seeker. Rules get bent. Why does McGonagall do this? She wants to win. Who's been winning the last couple of years? Slytherin. Slytherin. Who's head of Slytherin? Snape. Snape. And you, know, you get the impression they don't see eye to eye very well. Okay? So she bends the rules for what purpose? Okay, I mean, that's one of the rules she bench, she bends it like, you know, if I could get this end to touch this end, <laughs> okay? But for what purpose? Okay, she wants, let me put that in another way, but you're right. She wants to push Snape's face in it. In other words, she wants to win. So how important are rules then? Well, you know, we're going to see other rules within the 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 wizarding world, kind of modified to suit an individual's need. Okay, So it's on 152 that she tells him, 
Your father would have been proud. He was an excellent Quidditch player himself. So Harry finds out, I've got something in common with my father, other than he's my father, okay? So Malfoy challenges him to a wizard's duel, midnight. Does Malfoy show up? Is he really intending to challenge Harry? No, what does he want? He wants Harry to get in trouble. And he does kind of, in a sense, what trouble does Harry, Ron, and Hermione, because she's with them, what trouble do they not get in but find? The dog. The chihuahua? Yes. Essentially Cerberus, the three-headed dog that guards the entrance to Hades in the Greek underworld. Okay. But this one isn't named Cerberus. It's fluffy. <laughs> Giant, three-headed, something like a mastiff. Okay, Fluffy. What is it sitting on? <coughs> Notice who notices this. Hermione. Hermione notices it, that it's sitting on a trap door. Where is it? Third floor corridor, which they were told by Dumbledore in his beginning of the year speech, off limits. Okay. So, chapter 10, Halloween comes. Harry gets a new broom. McGonagall says, don't open it at the table. Really, how significant is it that he doesn't open it at the table? Students get mail during breakfast. Harry has two big owls drop a long slender thing, probably about the length of this desk, on his bowl of cereal. You know, it's not a uh, flint rifle, but it's long like one. Everybody knows what this thing is. Malfoy thinks Harry's going to get in trouble, and Harry says, you know, Malfoy, it's because of you that I get this broom. Thank you, essentially, just kind of turning things on Malfoy. So the lesson they have that day with Flitwick is when Guardian Leviosa, Ron gets paired with Hermione. How good is Ron at this charm? Yeah, he probably couldn't move the feather if he did <laughs> with Wingardium Leviosa. Hermione, however, gets it, you know, to hover and everything. So that when later they leave, I think it is potions. No, it's at the end of that class, okay? They leave that class, and Ron <coughs> says to Harry, page 172, it's no wonder no one can stand her. Okay, now, notice what Ron's doing there. He's peeved at Hermione because she showed him up in class. He extrapolates from her showing him up to no one likes her. She's a nightmare, honestly. Someone knocked into Harry as they already passed him. It was Hermione. Harry caught a glimpse of her face. She was in tears. I think she heard you. So, Ron says, looking a bit uncomfortable. She must have noticed she's got no friends. She doesn't show up for the next class. Isn't seen all afternoon. They hear later that she's crying in the girl's bathroom and wants to be left alone. Why in the girl's bathroom? Why doesn't she go up to her own room where she has a four-poster bed and can pull the curtains all the way around, have some privacy. Plot device. Because Rowling needs her to be in that third floor bathroom, okay? Because there are two things that are going to happen in this room. So, they're at dinner. Coral comes in and announces there's a troll in the basement. They all start to go back to the rooms. Harry and Ron wonder where Hermione is. And they see Snape go off. They kind of follow Snape. He's going off to the third floor corridor. <clears throat> they walk past the girl's bathroom and they notice a stench. They lock the key because they realize the troll's in there. And then they hear a blood-curdling scream. And they remember Hermione's in there. So Harry and Ron go in and they decide they're going to take on a troll. How do they do it? What does Harry do? Does he do Avada Kedavra? Does he do Impedimenta? Does he do um, any other charm? Jumps on his 
He jumps on his back. And in doing so, because he has his wand in his hand, right up the troll's nose. Angers the nose, angers the nose, and the troll. So that the troll drops his club at that point. Ron simultaneously, miraculously, does do when guarding Leviosa. The club goes up in the air, and then it drops on the troll's head, and they knock it out. Who shows up at that moment? Yeah, Snape shows up after, but McGonagall first. McGonagall. And she's like, what in the world are you doing? First you're thinking you could take on a mountain troll. And Hermione says what? Oh, I thought I could take it on. You know, I've read all about them. So she lies to McGonagall. And obviously, what happens to the three as a result of that? They're like the three musketeers, man. One for all, all for one. Except for two points in the next six years while they're at Hogwarts. Because Ron doesn't stick with Harry through thick and thin. Hermione does. Hermione never turns her back on Harry. She is always loyal. Ron isn't. Well, hold on, hold on, before we say anything else. Has everybody read all seven books? Or has anybody not read them? If you haven't, let me know. Because I don't want to give anything away. Spoiler. It's, it's been a long time, but I'm not. Yeah, spoiler. I, 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 no, but let me answer the question directly. No, it's not because of the Horcrux. It's because of Ron. Okay? And we'll talk about that when we get there. So, the next chapter, Quidditch. Quidditch is, is really big in the books, right? It's a major element through books one through seven. No, it's not. It's a major element kind of through books one through five. <coughs> Why? Because she needs to use Quidditch for something that comes out in book seven. So Harry has his first Quidditch match. Hermione thinks Snape's trying to, to um, jinx Harry because he's sitting there muttering under his mouth. She goes and lights him on fire, okay? How does Harry win this Quidditch match? He's a seeker. He's got to catch the golden snitch. He almost swallows it. He doesn't catch it with his hand. He catches it with his mouth somehow. That's an important plot device for the seventh book. How important ultimately is Quidditch within the novels? It's not and yet, it becomes what in the films? Huge. I mean, it's like, okay, this is where we can do all our great CGI. We can have Harry... In every Quidditch match he plays in, leave the pitch. You know, it's kind of interesting they refer to the Quidditch pitch, though they don't do anything on the ground, right? Everything's done up in the air. But there are boundaries to it. What, what are the boundaries? Well, there's the height boundaries and the walls of the stadium that they're playing in or the bleachers that people sit in, okay? And yet in every film, it seems like, or every instance of Quidditch in the film, where's Harry going? He's going off to the castle, flying over the lake, the forbidden forest, all this crazy stuff. So... Christmas is coming, the Mirror of Erised chapter. Harry's not going back to um, Privet Drive. He's going to stay at Christmas for the uh, holiday, uh, stay at Hogwarts for the holidays. They get Hagrid to blurt out something about Nicholas Flamel, so they start searching Nicholas Flamel. Okay? Christmas actually comes. It's Christmas morning, pages 200 to 201. Harry wakes up, and, Ron, and Harry says, top of 200, look, I've got presents. It's Christmas. I mean, unless you're Jewish or atheist or something, or Buddhist or whatever, and you're serious about your beliefs, okay, you get presents at Christmas. What does Harry's statement imply? He, he hasn't before. 
Does that mean the Dursleys don't celebrate Christmas? Probably not, because, I mean, they're not going to give Dudley presents on Christmas. I mean, he'd beat the snot out of them if they didn't. Okay? They said Harry hasn't gotten presents before. Ron, what did you expect? Turnips? So there's a top parcel. Harry picks it up and opens it. It's a present from Hagrid. And here's a hand-whittled flute. Has Harry shown any interest in music? Has Hagrid shown any interest in music? Has Hagrid shown any interest in woodworking of any kind? No. So why does Hagrid whittle Harry a flute? He, because it's a plot device. Exactly. Okay. He doesn't do anything in the remaining six books to show this kind of interest. In other words, this is an unmotivated action. Okay. It, it, it's an implausible action. Okay. This is an element of where her writing doesn't rise to the level of her storytelling. Okay? Because in writing, you want everything your characters to do to be plausible. You want them to flow out of the character of that individual. Now, when Hagrid blurts out stuff about, for example, when he tells them about Norbert, the Norwegian Ridgeback, and about the bloke that he got the egg from at the uh, Three Broomsticks, how did he get the egg? What was he doing at the Three Broomsticks? He's drinking and playing cards. Drinking and playing cards. We're going to find out. Hagrid likes the bottle a little bit. Okay? <laughs> so, what else does he get? The second thing he sees is a gift from the Dursleys. We received your message. What message? Send me a Christmas present? No, I'm not coming home for Christmas. And enclose your Christmas present. A 50 pence piece. This is what he gets from Christmas, or for Christmas. A 50 pence piece. At this time, worth about a dollar. Cheapskate <laughs> is the definition of the Dursleys. Okay? Ron, wow, that's weird. So this is money, huh? Ron, Harry gives it to them, uh, gives it to Ron. So he has another gift. Ron, oh, that's from my mom. And it's a Weasley sweater. She does what for all of her children? Makes each of them a sweater. Notice what we're seeing here. Molly Weasley, who has only met Harry once, kind of is taking Harry under her wing. Okay. So Harry is becoming a honorary member of the Weasley family. Harry, that's really nice. And, and there's Fudge. He has another gift from Hermione. Package, large box of chocolate frogs. And then there's a last one. He picks it up. It feels strange. Something fluid and silvery gray went slithering to the floor where it lay in gleaming folds. Run. Heard of those? If it's what I think it is, they're really rare and really valuable. How really rare are they? <laughs> no. In book four, Mad Eye Moody has two of them. Two of them. He loans one to somebody else. Or actually, take it back. It's book five. He has two of them. He loans one to somebody else. Okay. Hmm, kind of interesting. But in book seven, we get a little explanation about the difference between this one and the others. So, what is it? It's an invisibility cloak. Try it on. Harry puts, puts it on, and he goes invisible. And the note says, Your father left this in my possession before he died. It was time it was returned to you. Use it well. Okay. It's Christmas break. There aren't many students around. Not all of the staff is still there. Use it well means what to an 11-year-old in a massive thousand-year-old castle with all kinds of corridors and hallways and rooms? Go explore, man. Who wouldn't put it on and go explore? Run. I'd give anything for one of these. 
anything. What's the matter? Harry, I don't know. Who, who sent it to me? Had it really once belonged to his father? Notice he's been told something about his father now. And now he's been given something that belonged to his father. What did Harry have before that belonged to his father? Okay, other than his <laughs> genetic characteristics. <laughs> Nothing. He had no family heirloom of sorts. Okay, he, which he discovers on his 11th birthday. He'd not had that before. <laughs> but is money like something that belonged to your dad or mom? No, it's not. Okay. So, they go off for the Christmas feast. Harry had never eaten so much in all his life. He goes back up to his room that night, stuffed. He gets into bed after having, you know, a um, snowball fight and playing wizard's chess and such. He gets into his bed and he's holding it, just feeling it. And he thinks of the note. And he thinks this has been Dan's. Use it well. Okay. So he gets, puts it on and he goes out. Why does he go out? What is he specifically going to do? He's not going to just go explore. He wants to go into the restricted section of the library to find out about Nicholas Flamel. So he goes off. Mrs. Norris, that wretched cat, you know, is prowling around. He tries to ditch her. He hears Filch and Snape, and he runs into a classroom, page 207. And he sees this giant mirror stretching from floor to ceiling with this big gold frame around it. And the frame has inscribed at the top, which means, I show you not your face, but your heart's desire. Nope. Just reverse the letters. Just rearrange them. Okay. So I show you not your face, but your heart's desire. Now think about this for a moment. Harry looks in it. What does he see? First, first thing he sees, we're told, himself. He does see himself. He goes, he stands in front of the mirror. Top of 208. His panic fading now that there was no sound of Filch and Snape, Harry moved nearer to the mirror, wanting to look himself, but see no reflection again. He stepped in front of it. He had to clap his hands to his mouth to stop himself from screaming. He whirls around. He's holding his mouth, and he turns around. Why? His heart was pounding far more furiously than when the book had screamed, for he'd seen not only himself in the mirror. He does see himself. But he sees a whole crowd of people standing around him. So he looks, he sees himself, it's when he sees everybody else he throws his hand and he looks because he wants to know, are these people all here all of a sudden? But the room was empty. He turns slowly back to the mirror. There he was, reflected in it, white and scared looking. In other words, it's showing him exactly as he is at this moment. All right. And there, notice the verb, reflected behind him were at least ten others. Why reflected? That's what a mirror does, right? And yet, he turns around, there's nobody there. So the mirror isn't really reflecting, is it? Well, if you take the motto... I show you not your face, but your heart's desire. In a sense, it is reflecting. It's reflecting, according to that, Harry's heart's desire. Okay. I'm going to make the point, it's showing more than just Harry's heart's desire. In other words, I'm going to say, Dumbledore isn't telling Harry all the truth when he later on, two nights later, explains how the mirror works. Because there's at least ten other people there. Harry looks over his shoulder. Notice, what does he see? 
Nobody. It's an empty room. He turns back. Or were they all invisible too? What's Harry have on? He's still wearing the invisibility cloak. Okay. So what should the mirror show? It should show nothing. And yet it shows him white and scared. And all these other invisible people. So he's thinking, well, I'm invisible. Maybe they're all invisible too. Was he, in fact, in a room full of invisible people? And this mirror's trick was that it reflected them, invisible or not? Okay. Question is, are there people really there? Harry doesn't think so, because he can't see them. But then he thinks, but maybe they're invisible like I'm invisible. Hmm. He looked in the mirror again. So notice, I mean... Time has passed. We get again, then, etc. kind of verbs, uh, adverbs. Okay? He looks in the mirror again. Now what does he notice? A woman standing right behind his reflection was smiling at him and waving. She's standing right behind him, smiling, waving. Okay? Indicating what? She knows. Okay, she knows him. Think of the tense, waving, present participle. She's doing it right now. She's smiling right now, okay? He looks in the mirror. He reaches behind. He's trying to touch her, right? If she was really there, he'd touch her. Their reflections were so close together, but he felt only air. She and the others existed only in the mirror, Harry thinks. Okay? I threw in the Harry thinks. She was a very pretty woman. Dark red hair and her eyes. Harry thinks her eyes are just like mine. Getting closer to the glass. Bright green, exact same shape. But then he notices, okay, but then time passages. He notices that she was crying. When he first notices her, she's smiling and waving. Now he notices she's crying. Smiling, but crying at the same time. Why is she now crying? Crying, why? Why does she, why are these tears of joy? Louder. She can see him, okay? What else? He can, see her. he can see her. Keep going. You're almost there. What does she realize? He didn't know. No. He did this, right? She knows he sees her. Because when he does this, it's like, I know you're there somewhere. And now she's crying. Why is she crying? Because she knows he sees her. How many times has Harry seen his mother in the last 10 years? Nice. Zip. Not even a photograph. Okay. How many times has she seen him? No, since then. Since her death. Yeah, which we'll talk about a little bit later. But because she doesn't quote unquote haunt number four, Private Drive, she's never seen Harry from the day she died. Now she does, and now she sees, he sees her. Tears of joy. Notice, she's still smiling. These are happy tears. And what else? The tall, thin, black-haired man standing next to her does what? He puts his arm around her, indicating... Louder. They're together. What else? Why does he put his arm around her? He's comforting her. Okay, now, stop and think about this for a moment. The mirror shows your heart's desire. Is Harry's heart's desire to see his mother in tears and for his father to comfort her? No, that's utterly ludicrous. 
Children, first of all, don't want to see their parent, parents cry. It's disconcerting. Why? Because parents are supposed to be like rocks. Okay? What else is going on here? Within the world of the mirror, let's say, what do we see happening? We see the relationship between James and Lily. Lily cries for her lost son, lost to her. And James does what? In time, in present time, he tries to comfort her. Are these mere echoes? Are these mere reflections? No, because what does an echo always do? It merely repeats the last thing. These are acting right now, real time, and showing what? Each of them. They're showing awareness. They're so showing sensibility. Okay. Harry's now so close to the mirror, his nose is almost touching. Mom? Dad? They just look at him, smiling. Why don't they get a whiteboard? Harry! <laughs> it's us, you know. They'd seen the Martian. They arranged the rocks and everything. And slowly, Harry looks and he sees faces of other people. He sees his eyes in other faces. He sees his and his father's hair in other faces. Faces. He sees his knobbly knees. Harry was looking at his family for the first time in his life. The potters smiled and waved. That's not James and Lily. That's all of the potters. Okay, All smile and wave. Okay, These are his parents, his grandparents, his great-grandparents, okay? all of whom lived when? Different generations than James and Lily. These are all the dead potters. How long he stood there? Back, in, back up. Harry stared hungrily back at them. His hands pressed flat against the glass as though he was hoping to fall right through it and reach them. Why would he want to reach them? There is family to be reunited. What would it mean for Harry to reach them, though? What does Harry have to become? His hands are like this on the mirror. What might Harry be thinking? If Harry read any quote-unquote children's literature, what book might Harry have read by Lewis Carroll? Through the Looking Glass. It's one of the ways Alex gets into Neverland. The other one is going down the rabbit hole. Right? He had a powerful kind of ache inside him. Half joy? Why? This is what my parents look like. Have sadness. What's the sadness? Louder? He can't be with them. He also can't what? Okay, he can't stay in the room forever. He can't fold the mirror up, take it up to his room. He can never touch them or speak to them. And they can't speak to him. Okay? He goes back and tells Ron when he hears a noise. They go back the next night. Page 2, 10. They get in there. There's Harry. He sees his mom and dad. They beam at the sight of him. I mean, just glowing. Again, indicating what about the images in the mirror? Are they just in the mirror? No. These are real. They're as real as you and I. Harry just can't what? See them. Except through the mirror. Harry, see? Ron, I can't see anything. Look, look at them. There are loads of them. Where's Ron standing and where's Harry standing? If this black or this gray tile is the mirror, Harry's standing dead center in front of it. Ron's off to the side. Ron says, I just see your reflection. Why? Because Ron's reflection isn't anywhere in the mirror. In other words, if Harry wasn't standing there, what would Ron see? 
draw an angle, you'd see whatever's over here. So here he says, look at it properly. Go on, stand where I am. Ron, look at me. You see all your family standing around you? No, I'm, I'm, I'm alone, but I'm different. I, I look older, and I'm head boy. What? Notice here, it's what? You? <laughs> I am. I'm, I'm wearing the badge like Bill used to, and I'm, I'm holding the house cup and the Quidditch cup. I'm Quidditch captain, too. Harry, Ron tore his eyes away to look at Harry. Do you think this mirror tells the future? Please, God, please. No. Harry, how can it? All my family are dead. Okay, not a bad mind. Not a great one either. How can Harry see himself surrounded by all his dead family? Become unliving? <laughs> In other words, when Harry's dead, guess what? There they'll be, if you believe in the reality of the soul and that there being something after death. Harry doesn't show that kind of logic here. Okay? Let me have another look. You had it to yourself all last night. Give me a bit more time. You're only holding the Quidditch cup. What's interesting about that? I want to see my parents. In other words, Harry says, you're merely holding a physical material object. What else is Ron seeing, though? Louder. The status changes. What else? Harry wants to see himself surrounded by his family. Ron wants to be at the top of his family. Or Ron wants to be seen as himself. Not merely the sixth Weasley son. Okay. They hear a noise. They leave. Harry goes back the next night. Page 212. There was nothing to stop him from staying here all night with his family. Notice his father and mother smiling again, one of his grandparents nodding. And Harry just sits down on the floor. He's just going to sit there and watch this all night long. So, back again, Harry. Harry felt as though his inside had turned to ice. There, he turns around behind him. And there, sitting on one of the desks, is Albus Dumbledore up against the wall. I, I didn't see you, sir. Strange how nearsighted being invisible can make you. What's nearsightedness? You see stuff well where? Okay. How nearsighted does being invisible make you? Like this, Dumbledore says. So you like hundreds before you have discovered the delights of the mirror of Erised. I didn't know that's what it was called, but I expect you've realized by now what it does. What's Dumbledore doing? What's he always doing when he talks with Harry? He's teaching. This is Socrates, asking questions, drawing the knowledge out. Uh, shows me my family. <laughs> And it showed your friend Ron himself as head boy. I don't need a cloak to become invisible. Hmm. Yet at the end of the novel, we're going to be told by Dumbledore, he was the one who gave Harry the cloak back. What did the note say? Your father left this in my keeping when he died. Well, why would Dumbledore need an invisibility cloak when he can make himself invisible without one? Hmm. Okay, so can you think what the mirror of Earth said shows us all? Harry, <laughs> no idea. Okay, let me explain. The happiest man on Earth would be able to use the mirror of Earth said like a normal mirror. That is, he'd see himself exactly as he is. Does that help? Not really. <laughs> Harry doesn't have a clue, really, what Dumbledore means, because Harry says it shows us what we want. What would the happiest man on the world in the world? C. What does he want? Nothing. Nothing. Why? Totally content. He has no desires, no needs, no wants. Harry shows us what we want. Dumbledore, eh, close. It shows us nothing more or less than the deepest, most desperate desire of our hearts. 
Okay, so if that is all the truth about the mirror, what is the deepest, most desperate desire of Harry's heart? What's Dumbledore say? You, who have never known your family, see them standing around you. Is that it? I don't think so. I think she's showing a lot more than just that. Okay? Because of what happens with the images he sees in the mirror. The fact that they seem to move and live and breathe. That James comforts Lily. That they start waving and smiling, going through tears and beyond. Ron, who has always been overshadowed by his brother, sees himself standing alone. Okay. This mirror will give us neither knowledge or truth. He says, hundreds have been driven mad by this. Men have wasted away before it, entranced by what they've seen or been driven mad, not knowing if what it shows is real or even possible. He says, here, I'm going to move the mirror to a new location tomorrow. Don't go looking for it. But if you should, by chance, ever run into it again, now you will be prepared. Now you will be prepared for what? The grand chess master is moving the chess pieces. He's just told Harry how the mirror works, just in case you ever see it again. All right. Harry asks Dumbledore, what do you see when you look into the mirror? Wool socks. So how close to being totally content is Dumbledore? Nearly there. But why does he see wool socks? Is he lying? Yes, he is. Really? Where do they live? In a big thousand-year-old castle made of Stone with no central heat and air. These things get cold in the winter. Last winter, um, my family and I went to Prague for 10 days. My eldest daughter was there, so we visited her. And we went to Prague Castle on, I don't remember what it was, 22nd or something like that. And Prague Castle's a thousand-year-old castle, all made out of stone, and it has no heat. And it was like 30 degrees that day. And we froze walking around this blasted castle for four or five hours, okay? Because what does stone do? It retains, it sucks in the cold, which is why, reverse that, you go there in August when it can hit 100 degrees, and what does stone do with heat? It retains it and then radiates it, okay? It radiates the cold, too. That's why, you know, you go by a castle when it's, Six, when it's 20 degrees outside, you don't want to touch that stone because it's like ice. Okay? I think he's being honest. That's what he sees. I would think that uh, he wasn't being totally truthful. I figured when he would actually see his, see his sister. Possible. Okay, so the next chapter is Nicholas Flamel. They put two <laughs> and two together. Okay. Then we get Norbert, the Norwegian Ridgeback, and... They help Hagrid get Norbert uh, away. But in the process, they get caught by McGonagall. And who ends up with detention with Hagrid in the Forbidden Forest? Harry, Draco, Hermione, and Neville. What happens to Ron? He gets bit, okay? So they go off with Hagrid into the Forbidden Forest. What's Harry thinking about this detention? Score, man. This is great. I mean, it's the Forbidden Forest. You're 11 years old. You get a go in it with a guy who knows everything about it. So how does Hagrid break them up? We also have Hagrid and Fang, the Boram. How does Hagrid initially break them up? Draco, Neville, Fang, and Hermione, Harry, Hagrid. Draco, Neville, Fang. Why does he have to redo them? Neville, Neville freaks out because Draco plays a practical joke on him. So 
he redoes them so that it's Hagrid, Hermione, Neville, and Harry, Draco, and Fang. Why? Because Hagrid thinks Neville's not going to be able to play a trick like that on a uh, Drubble. Draco isn't going to be able to play that kind of trick on Harry. So, they're going off. They're looking for this wounded unicorn. They see blotches, splotches of blood and stuff. It's on 253 when Hagrid asks Ronan and Bane you know, if they've seen anything funny, and they keep saying, Mars is great tonight. What does that mean? Louder? Yeah. War's coming. Mars is the god of war. Okay? Mars is bright tonight means Mars is in ascension. War is nearly here. 2.55. And I know I'm spending way too much time on this. 2.55. Harry and Draco see something off in the clearing. And Harry says, look! He throws his hand out to stop Draco. Why? Louder? What's he doing? He's protecting Draco. Why didn't he say, look, Draco, why don't you go see what that is? <laughs> Even his arch enemy, Harry tries to protect. Harry tries to save. All right? They go a little closer. Draco screams when they see the thing come up from the unicorn side. Harry's head explodes. Ferenc comes in, says, you're the Potter boy. You shouldn't be here. How does Ferenc know that Harry's the Potter boy? Has Hagrid been sending out word? Scar on his forehead. Okay. And so what does Ferenc do? Get on my back. Bane comes in, not happy. And Ferenc says, 257, do you not see that unicorn? Do you not understand why it was killed? Or have the planets not let you in on that secret? I set myself against what is lurking in this forest bane. Yes, with humans alongside me, if I must. In other words, he's kind of saying, the enemy of my enemy, that's my friend, my enemy, Ferenc is saying, the thing that's sucking blood from unicorns. I know what it is. You know what it is. Kid with me. Completely clueless. <laughs> right? So, Bane goes on. Here's like, golly gee, Mr. Friends. Why was Bane so angry? <coughs> he says, do you know what unicorn blood's used for? Nope, we've only used the horn and the tail. Why do they only use the horn and the tail? Fingernails. What do they do if you don't clip them? They keep growing. The horn grows back. The tail grows back. The blood, not so much once you kill one. He says, only one who has something, nothing to lose and everything to gain would commit such a crime to slay a unicorn. The blood of a unicorn will keep you alive even if you're an inch from death. But a terrible price. What's the terrible price? You will have a half-life, a cursed life from the moment the blood touches your lips. Notice what Harry says. Who'd be that desperate? I mean... If you're going to be cursed forever, death's better, isn't it? What's Harry just said? Some things are worth dying for. Death is better than... You fill in the X, Y, Z. Death is better than living damned. Okay? For instance, it is, unless all you need to stay alive forever is a certain drink. Do you not know what is hidden at the school? And Harry says, yes. Notice, friends. Kind of ask that question implying, doesn't everybody know what's hidden up at the school? Not a very good, well-kept secret. And can you think of nobody? Notice, again, Socratic method. He's just asking Harry questions. Okay, Drawing the truth out of him. Is there nobody who's waited many years to return to power? And the light bulb goes off. You mean it was Volt? And Hagrid comes in. Okay. So he says to Harry, Good luck, Harry Potter. The planets have been read wrongly before now, even by centaurs. What does that imply? 
you're screwed, kid. <laughs> the planets are saying, you got to die. All right? So here he goes off to his room. He tells Ron, Voldemort's trying to get the stone. And there's the invisibility cloak on his bed, just in case. Where did he leave it? Yeah. Top of the astronomy tower when they were getting rid of Norbert. So next chapter, through the chapter door. Through the chapter door. Through the trap door. All right. They try to go to McGonagall. She brushes them off. Page 270. Harry tells Ron and Hermione, I'm going through the trap door tonight. Hermione, well, you can't. You'll get in trouble. You'll be expelled. And Harry gives us a little speech, which to me at least, and maybe I'm just being too persnickety about this, Harry gives us a little speech that he betrays some information that he doesn't yet have. In other words, he says some things that he shouldn't be saying yet because he doesn't have the information that those things are based on. That's going to come in just a few moments. Harry, so what? Don't you understand? If Snape gets hold of the stone, Voldemort's coming back. Haven't you heard what it was like when he was trying to take over? Has Harry heard what it was like? No. Has Harry read a book he hasn't had to read? Pretty clear from all the books. No. Harry's not a, a real good reader. Who would have read and known what it was like when Voldemort was in power? Hermione. Hermione. Who would have known somewhat because of where he grew up? Ron. Okay. There won't be any Hogwarts to get expelled from. He'll flatten it or turn it into a school for the dark arts. Losing points doesn't matter, matter anymore, can't you see? Do you think he'll leave you and your families alone if Gryffindor wins the House Cup? Notice what Harry is ultimately saying there about Quidditch. It's a stupid sport. It's not important. Whether they take a knee or not, you know. If I get caught before I can get to the stone, well, I'll have to go back to the Dursleys. He's thinking, okay, so I get expelled. Big deal. And wait for Voldemort to find me there. Okay, here's the first problem. What is Harry saying there? Voldemort's looking for me. Has anybody told him, Voldemort's looking for you? Has anybody told him, Voldemort's out to kill you. No, we know Voldemort's killed a lot of people in the past, which is why McGonagall says in that first chapter, you know, how could he not kill Harry Potter when he killed all these others? So that's the first point. I'll just stay there and wait for Voldemort to find me there. It's only dying a bit later than I would have. The implication is Voldemort wants to kill me. Okay, that's the second little point. Because I'm never going over to the dark side. Well, when did Darth Vader invite him to? <laughs> Have we heard anybody say, Harry, join me, and together we will rule? We get one little instance, echo of that. Where is it? Draco. Draco, on the train. Why do I say it's a little instance. It's an echo of it. What does Draco actually say? Does he say, join me, and together we will become the most powerful dark? No. Join me, and I'll lead you to my master, Lord Voldemort. No. <laughs> he says, be my friend, and I can help you make other friends. <coughs> and he says, you ought to be a bit more politer. Great English there, by the way. And or what? Or you'll go the way of your parents. Be a bit politer or you're going to die like your mom and dad. That's hardly join with Lord Voldemort. Okay? Because I'm never going over to the dark side. I'm going through the trap door tonight. Nothing you two say is going to stop me. Voldemort killed my parents, remember? Does that Voldemort killed my parents mean... They both say, you're right, Harry. We're coming with you. All right? Think about this. 
How successful would Harry be if Ron and Hermione don't come with him? Not at all. How would Harry have gotten past um, Fluffy? No, because it's Hermione who saw the trap door. Okay, he does remember to bring the flute, place the flute. They get through the trap door. What's the next trial? Devil snare. Who gets them out of that? Hermione. How? No. Fire. She's good with fire, okay? But what else was needed there? Hermione says, ooh, it's devil snare, as it's starting to wind around them and kill them. <laughs> ooh, all we need now is fire. I wish we had some fire. <laughs> and Ron, I think it is, goes, well, are you a witch or not? Come on. Oh, yeah, that's right. I can conjure fire out of thin air. And she does, okay? What's next? Flitwick, keys, it's flying. Here's a natural there. So there was one he could get them out of. The next one would be the troll, which is already disposed of. Okay. So, okay, Harry and Ron, they've already dealt with the troll. Maybe Harry could have done that on his own. What's next? Wizarding chess. How far would Harry have gone? Maybe three moves, four at most. How do they get across? Ron sacrifices himself. Harry's like, no, Ron. He says, hey, man. Sometimes sacrifice has got to be made. Does Ron know when he sacrifices himself he's going to live? No, because the queen is what? Made out of what? Is she neoprene or plastic or something? Does she have, you know, bubble wrap around her so that she won't hurt the little children? No, she goes and wraps him upside the head. He's out. Okay? What's next? Snake, potions, but what is it really? Logic Harry is dead at this point. <laughs> I mean, just dead. Logic? Nope. Hermione gets him through there. And what does she tell him before she goes back to get Ron and help, and before Harry goes through? She says, Harry, you know you're a great wizard, right? He's like, you get first in everything. And she says, oh, books and cleverness. There is more than that, she says. Two eighty seven. There are more important things friendship <coughs> and bravery. What are both friendship and bravery? They're not tangible things, right? No, they're not. What are they? <coughs> They're virtues. They are virtues. They are ideals to be practiced. Okay? Cleverness? It's not really a virtue. Book knowledge? It's hard work. Or in Hermione's case, and probably many of your cases, it's easy. Okay? For Harry, not as much. For Ron, definitely not as much. Okay? So... Harry goes through, what does he discover? You? It's a quarrel. But I thought Snape. Severus? He does seem the type, doesn't he? Right? Always berating students, always picking on Harry. And he describes Snape as swooping like a bat. It's the first reference we get to Snape as being bat-like. She's going to continue that reference through all seven books. To the extent that a lot of people thought Snape was a vampire of sorts. And she said in a couple of interviews, because that's what I wanted them to think. <laughs> it's called a red herring. Here, Fido, chase the bone. So that we don't see the real Severus Snape. So he and Harry talk, and, he, and Quirrell says, you know, Voldemort's always with me. Harry said, wait, you mean he was even in that classroom with you when I heard you and Snape? He is with me, top of 291, wherever I go. I met him when I traveled around the world. A foolish young man I was then, full of ridiculous ideas about good and evil. What are the ridiculous ideas about good and evil? That there is good and evil. 
He tells us, next line, there is no good and evil. There is only power. And those too weak to seek it. Notice that. There is no morality. There's only power. You want what you want out of life? Take it. Screw everybody else. Okay? There's only power and those too weak to seek it. Okay? So that's what Voldemort teaches them. So they keep talking. And Voldemort says, show me, let me see him. And page 294. Harry backs away. Harry now has the stone in his pocket. And Voldemort says, don't be a fool. Better save your own life and join me. Or you'll meet the same end as your parents. They died begging me for mercy. Liar, liar, pants on fire. <laughs> as we see in later books. They didn't die begging for mercy. Well, one kind of did. But James didn't. So what does Harry do? He goes up and touches him. When he realizes Quirrell can't touch him without being burned. And Harry wakes up. Page 296. He says, sir, the stone. Chill, Harry. <laughs> he looks around, all kinds of presents and stuff. How long have I been in here? Three days. Why three days? Because Jesus was three days in the tomb. Okay. Does that mean Harry is Jesus? Yes. No. Does that mean Harry is a type of Jesus? Yes. I'm using type in what's called the biblical interpret interpretive style. He is a, a figuring of Jesus. Just like in the Old Testament, Samson is a type of Jesus. Does that mean Jesus and only own to only have strength, has to have really long hair, and then he's going to go marry some Philistine whore? No. It means, what does Samson do for the Israelites? He delivers them. Moses is a type of Jesus. Moses doesn't get into the promised land. Does that mean Jesus doesn't get into the promised land? No. It means Moses is a deliverer. David is a type of Jesus. Okay. Harry is a type of of Jesus, okay? Kind of symbolic of him. And the symbolism is just made blatantly clear in the last book when um, we're going to hear some other stuff about him. So, here he goes on. And Dumbledore says, the stone's going to be destroyed. But your friend, Nicholas Fumel, 297, you did do the thing properly, didn't you? What does that first did tell us? Okay, not only is it past tense, it's telling us Dumbledore knew Harry was going to try to go after the stone. And he's saying, well done, old boy. You researched it. You went to the library first. Good job. But Harry's like, okay, but they're going to die. Yeah. They're going to die. They've got enough elixir to set their affairs in order. Dumbledore smiled at the look of amazement on Harry's face. Because Harry's thinking, but they're going to die. <laughs> to one as young as you, I'm sure it seems incredible. But to Nicholas and Perinelle, it really is like going to bed after a very, very, very long day. We're told at some point, it's not in Pottermore, it's even before Pottermore, that Nicholas Flamel is 665 years old. By the way, Nicholas and Perinel Flamel, real people. 16th century French alchemists. That is, they really were seeking the Philosopher's Stone. Okay. So what's the longest you've ever stayed awake? 24 hours, 36, 48, 72? Okay. So that's how Nicholas and Perinel feel. <laughs> When they stop taking the elixir, it's just like they're, you know, just dying, kind of literally, to get into bed. So what does Dumbledore then say? After all, to the well-organized mind, death is but the next great adventure. 
Notice what death is not. First of all, it's not the end. It's not you die and your molecules just dissipate and your consciousness is no more. Why? Rowling isn't an atheist. She believes there's something after death. Right? But it's only a great adventure for whom? Those with a well-organized mind. What does it mean to have a well-organized mind? To be prepared for death. Yes. No. Well, other than lives one more year and <laughs> yeah, mark of the beast kind of thing. This was one of the things that drove a lot of you know my terminology. Christian wackos upset when um, the books came out because they were like, oh look, there's the mark of the beast, you know. Um, you know, I'm, and I'm Christian. I started a church here in town called Antiochian Orthodox. Go every Sunday, serve at the altar, the whole nine yards. Um, but, I mean, that's just nonsense, a lot of that stuff. So, he says, the stone was not such a wonderful thing. Why not? I mean, think about it. What does he say it can give you? As much money in the life as you could want. Okay, if I were to take a poll in here and say, if you could have as much money in the world as you wanted... Would you take it? And I bet 99% of hands would go, yep, that's me. And then you wouldn't have to die. Maybe not 99%, but probably a majority would go, yep, that's me. What does he say about those two things? Two things most human beings would choose. The trouble is humans have a knack of choosing precisely those things that are worse for them. So is he saying untold wealth in immortality are exactly the two things that are worst for us? Because if we have a tendency to choose the things that are worst for us, and those are the two things most of us would want, he seems to be saying those are the two things that would be worst for us. So if those are the worst, what would be the best? Death and poverty? Well, if you take Rowling's Christianity into it, what does Christ say to his disciples? You must do what? Take up your cross and follow me. What does that mean to take up the cross? Be prepared to die. There's the death part. Okay. What did he tell the rich young ruler? He says, I keep all the law, all the, the laws. What else do I need to do? Christ says, go and sell all that you have and follow me. That takes care of the money part. So, you got to be poor and die early? No. It's an attitude. It's an attitudinal change that Dumbledore seems to be talking about. In other words, you shouldn't get bogged down in the desire for stuff. It's death to the world, kind of. Okay? And not a desire for material wealth. Okay? So... Here he says, Voldemort said some stuff. I want some answers. I want the truth. Why did he want to kill me? Can't answer. Next question. Okay, what's the next question? Why couldn't Quirrell touch me? Love. Because your mother died to protect you, sacrifice, you have something in your blood, Harry, becomes very important later on. All right, we'll stop there. Obviously, we did not get to Chamber of Secrets. So it's Chamber of Secrets on Tuesday, all of it. I know, you don't believe me anymore.